Hi, everybody, and welcome to Lunch Across America. I'm Stormy Simon, your host, and I'll be serving real talk. I'm a businesswoman, e-commerce pioneer, and an outspoken advocate, and that's a long cry from where I came from. This season, as you know, we're doing lunch with a twist. We're meeting incredible people across the country, and today I'm broadcasting to you from Blanding, Utah, and I have a very special guest. Her name is Savina Smith, and she's an indigenous Diné woman who has devoted her life to giving and helping others while raising awareness for her people. This woman is fantastic. She became an activist at the age of 10, and she's now known for running 360 miles to shed light on issues that impact Indigenous people. In 2019, she began her prayer run from Bears Ears National Monument to Salt Lake City, Utah. She carried a sacred medicine bundle that contained dozens of plant species that grow in the high meadows and the ponderosa pine forest near Barrett's ears. And other runners joined her along the way, and it didn't take long to cross the current boundary of Bears Ears National Park, which had been reduced to 15% of its original size by President Donald Trump, reduced 85%. He did that in 2017. It wasn't until day three of the run that Davina crossed the original boundaries that were designated by President Barack Obama at the end of his second term. It took three days. There's a lot to savor today. Join me in welcoming this woman who is so inspiring, so unique, and every step she takes is to be an example for future generations. Davina Smith. Good morning, Stormy and Josh. Thank you for having me here. Okay, well, let's definitely go back to history. So let's talk about Columbus, which Columbus did not discover the United States. Columbus came actually to a small um, island and um, I'm going to say affected affected and infected the tribes there. And um, so that is something that we uh, have brought that awareness. And as you have seen across the US, a lot of the names have been changed to Indigenous Day rather than Columbus Day. So that's been, that is, that's been replaced as, um, um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's about time, I guess, um, to have those correct histories implemented. Now in the school system, that is something that's still being worked on because, you know, a lot of our history is, is either erased or not even being spoken upon. And it's not only for um, our indigenous um, histories, but also our other BIPOC histories that are connected to the US. And so um, so that is something and that- Can you tell everybody what BIPOC stands for? BIPOC is the black indigenous people of color. Um, that's, a, that's a word just to combine. And I love that because it talks about unity. It's about how we are all coming together in this, in this day and age and, you, and uniting in things that um, are injustices that are happening across the board, whether that's with, um, with police brutality or with missing murdered indigenous women or you know, boarding schools or recently with our, our Asian community members. You know? So that is where, when I talk about Bi- BIPOC, it's about me including everyone that's of color in this, in this issue um, that's going on to, di- um, to today. Um, in terms of my prayer run, um, that area is definitely important to me. Um, I, 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 did, I was born in Northern Arizona, so Tuba City area. And from, for us, you know, we don't, we cannot say like, oh, that's my home. That's, you know, that's a home that my parents purchased because, um, we have to have home side lease. We don't have homes that we can, we can own on our own. So, um, and, and that was the reservation when the reservation was implemented, it was basically a cattle as like a cat, like we were cattle placed in these reservations. Um, and, um, watched over by when moved from land you had developed, right? right? You were moved from home that we you were, had. It's not like you no. were living on this land and they said, keep it. No, yeah, we, we lived in these. Right, you were displaced. We roamed in, in form of protection. You know, we had our summer 
um, place where we we would we would uh, tend to or we would have our winter home. Um, so we migrated in different locations, and it was all pertaining to what where we can gather foods or our hunting. And so when Manifest Destiny came and saw a lot of the land as dollar signs um, and places for them to own and take over. Um, and these were very pristine, precious lands. And when they saw that natives were in those areas, they the best thing they could do is um, gather their military cavalry men and come to these areas and push away, push natives into reserva- onto reservations. That's where treaties were implemented. That's where um, the Dawes Act was implemented. Um, the Trail of Tears, um, massacre, genocide, um, s- diseases, everything they could possibly do to eradicate Native peoples across the United States. Today, we only have 574 tribes before um, English or white men had, had settled. We were 80% more of of that, if you can imagine. Wow. wow. So but now what year was the Dawes Act? Because I think it's in imp- what year was the Dawes Act? Um the and Dawes I, I feel like we think about this, yeah, this history and it's so far back, but it's it's kind of recent history. The the Dawes Act was implemented in 1887, and it was to regulate land rights on tribal territories within the United States. Um, And so basically it was to divide, subdivide Native um, American tribal communal land holdings into allotments for Native Natives, um, families, and individuals. And so, as I mentioned, um, you know, for me to, to want a piece of land on my own homeland on the Diné Nation, um, I have to go through what's a process for to get um, get a home site lease. So it's in an acre, you know, and that's what I'm working on. Um, but, you know, just to say, okay, I, I'm connected <laughs> to my homeland, but I have to go through this ordeal process. Um, and so we do pay taxes. We still, we, and there's a lot of myths out there. We, we don't pay taxes. We, we are rich off casino money. Uh, we don't pay uh, uh, tuition. Um, I, I am, I have to say, honestly, I, I have a lot of student loans be, uh, for me going to school. Um, and I don't, I don't have per capita. I don't have money off of casino money. Um, and I don't own my land, but I still do pay my taxes. Um, so this area that I've, that upsets me so much, that just upsets me so much because, you know, we write history as if this land was given and allotted and everything's great as if we're some sort of even, but that's, it's not the case at all. No, it's not not the case at all. No. No taxes and you can't own your land. Right, exactly. And, um, and when we're talking more about history, you know, let's talk about the, um, let's go actually to the top, to the Constitution. I mean, in there, there's some words, uh, there are merciless savages. We're referred to as the savages. Um, the Constitution, I mean, that the form of government was actually um, implemented from um, the Iroquois Confederacy. So there's a lot that um, has been uh, copied or um, accustomed to from tribes when white men came, when they saw our form of government and our form of how we in- engage. I mean, restorative justice, let's talk about that. That is a that is a tribal um, that comes from indigenous communities. When, when we had um, some ordeal or something we had to deal with, which with uh, a neighbor of ours, you know, we'd have our our leader, tribal leader come and we'd sit in a circle and say, okay, let's talk, let's talk this out. And, and today that's, that's what was implemented as restorative justice. So there's a lot that um, has been taken from um, native, um, from peoples, not only their lands, but their um, traditional ways, their sometimes their language, and even today our designs. Let's talk about wardrobe. Let's talk about our our jewelry. Um, that's also being taken from from native uh, communities as well. 
Well, it would be nice. And you and I talked about this. I said to Davina, because I have, it's important during conversations that we're having as a country right now, because they bubble up and it might be uncomfortable, but the uncomfortable part is not knowing. So Davina taught me the term white ally. And that's a great term. I love yeah. that, but it, it gives me a way to identify myself. Um, and then I spoke with her about my own experiences with, you know, and I, I don't know because I haven't been in a true Native American, add it into your, your world. It makes me jealous. Um, um, and she said, don't be jealous. Just keep learning, like keep learning. So wouldn't it be great if at the end of all of this, we find out that white man came in and sold the culture. So some of our cultures are actually your culture. Um, you know, the appropriation of cultures, you know what I mean? And that expands to so many different cultures that, you know, really then they, the white man and white people have, have, you know, adapted and, and really procreated into their own, um, you know, and I think there's a fine line between. We didn't procreate into our own. We, we took away. Right. Like we Sorry. Yes. That's what I, that's what I meant. Yes. Yes. Beliefs and culture. Right. Appropriated. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. We just. We did. And I think there's a fine line between allyship and respect and, and admiration for community and appropriation and taking something as your own. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When we talk about allyship and I, I mean, I can't speak for every, for other BIPOC groups, but allyship basically. And when, when um, I'm asked that question, what that, what does that, what that look like for them or mean for them? It's basically don't um, speak for us but help, uh, help us amplify what we are, what we are speaking about, you know, our perspectives, our narratives, um, because when, when it is not our voices being heard and it's majority of the white population that feel that they're being supportive, um, it's still not, that's still not being an ally because you're now, you're still speaking for us. Um, and so, it's really they call that white savior complex, right? Right, exactly, exactly. White savior complex. Have you heard that term? Yeah, I have, I have. I even, I mean, even in in, in film, you know, you always hear the the, the white man savior, um, and they, these are good films. But you know, you have the Kevin Costner in Dances with Wolves. You have Daniel Day Lewis and Last of the Mohicans. Those are white man savior. You know, there's there's a lot more stories about where we didn't have white man saviors. And those are stories that need to be told um, historically and, and currently. Um, but like I said, my grandmother, my late grandmother, Catherine Smith, she was a savior. Well, I shouldn't say savior. She was, she was an elder who was doing what she needed to do. And that was to protect her homeland and protect her family, um, not only her children, but her community. And so a number of other resistors um, alongside her, like her other sisters who lived down the road and her other relatives came in and said, you know, no one's going to push us away. We're not going to force, we're not going to be forced to relocate. Um, and so one of the things that, that kept her strongly connected was our umbilical cord. In our Diné culture, uh, when the baby's umbilical cord falls off, our mothers bury them within um, our homeland, knowing that we can return to that location when we need to um, just, you know, re rejuvenate. We need to be connected to Mother Earth. Um, so those are things that we talk about in terms of being that white ally. I'm telling, I'm opening up and letting you know what, a little bit about myself, you know. But it doesn't, it isn't for you to say, oh, you know what? Do, this is this is what Dinette people do. No, it's like this is what I heard from a Dinette woman, um, and these are things. These are ways in which yes. to help. You know, you're not speaking for me and saying, oh, I know that they do this. I know that they do that. No, that's not helping us um, because it's basically saying that, oh, I know. Amplifying your that. voice is what we should be doing. Yes. Yes. And it's in across native country. Well, we need to start listening. Yeah, we need to start listening and assuming. And that's what I like about these conversations is because. Right, right. I agree. Um, yeah, books are definitely um, evolving and changing. And I think with those books in terms of uh, indigenous books that are coming out as well, um, when you're reading those books, and you're, you know, you see 
kind of shed some light, but I think it's also important to connect with whatever community you're involved with or where you live, because that also is a, another form of understanding um, history. I mean, here in the state of Utah, there's eight tribes, but do a number of people know what those eight tribes are here in Utah? So um, those are things in which that um, we, we, we try and discuss. Um, there's a new, there's a website called native uh, land.ca. And that is something that I talk about whenever I'm doing a, a speaking event or something. Um, it, what it does, it actually gives what land you're on, um, the location, what land was indigenous to that area. Uh, when I wow. land acknowledgement, land acknowledgement is so important, you know, um, for you being in Cortez, you know, you could open up and saying, you know, I'm here on the land of the, the uh, Ute tribe, the Southern Ute. Um, and so it just gives that, that, wow, oh my goodness, um, get, we're on, on, on this native land, but also it gives recognition to show that we are still here. As I said, there's 574 tribes. Um, and so it gives it gives uh, that in depth perspective. Um, I think I told you, Stormy, on our phone call, we were put in this museum right across the dinosaurs, and so that gives that perception we are extinct, just like the dinosaurs. So um, so now let's look at how we can show there are tribes still here in the U.S. and and this is another way is to acknowledge the land. Okay. I, I, you dropped off for me on that museum. You're put in this museum. Uh, I was saying that we were put in this museum right across the dinosaurs. And so there is that mindset that we are extinct as well as, uh, as, as equal to the dinosaurs. Ooh. So with that being said, you know, that is why we as native people across the U.S., we have what we call land acknowledgement, but um, also a lot of the work that we do, um, we're just, we are trying to change that perception that we are not extinct. We are here. We will continue to be here and we shall remain here. Like I love the umbilical cord, mm -hmm. the embryo, yeah. <laughs> the umbilical cord. Like how beautiful is that? Yeah. That's when I get jealous, right? It's like, Oh, I want my space. There's no be more beautiful connection with the earth than that. Like you're really saying, like mm -hmm. you belong here, human. This is your place. That's beautiful. And having your place, but like being a steward of the earth and learning those traditions. Um, and I had shared with Davina, but I had a, a Native American woman that helped me with my house and just stuff. And she would do these beautiful things. Um just in her everyday thing, like, oh, I'm just staging your corners today. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you're right. I do need to keep that energy mm -hmm. flowing. And just those little gifts, but really she was being a steward of the land and the earth at all times. And I think that is something if people can just learn that tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I remember the commercial, Josh brought it up on this drive over. We were looking at garbage as we were driving down the road. And Josh said, that's why the Native American cries. And everyone remembers that commercial when you're growing up and there's a Native American man on his horse. He has his face paint and someone throws something out their car window and a tear rolls down his face. Do you remember that, Davina, that commercial? I do. I do remember. And it's true. And so here we are on their land looking at the garbage. It's ridiculous. So as you know, you have someone on the show who is very vocal in these in, in making sure that perception is, is perceived as correct. So two things, because um, now we're going to have some in-depth conversations. You mentioned jealousy. Perfect. You know, you mentioned jealousy. So when you had mentioned jealous, I just want you to think about that word when speaking to a BIPOC person, because our form of jealousy is we would love to not have our black community gunned down. 
we would love to have not have our missing murdered indigenous women, but have law enforcement support us when a native woman is going missing rather than amplifying a white person's child who has gone missing and it goes on media. You have a number of big supporters coming in supporting that. And then also you have the Asian community where an elderly woman who was beaten by a young white boy we have a lot of jealousy, but we don't, we don't go and say, you know, we wish we were a different color. We deal, we, not, not that we deal with, but we love who we are. We're resilient in that sense. But, you know, I just want to keep in mind, you know, when you say that, be careful and be cautious because there could be another person that says, oh, this white person's telling me that right. she's jealous of, of, of where I don't be a Karen. (laughs) Another thing I want to put out there is, you know, that trash. So we talk, so let's go into media. Let's go into film. Um, There are a lot of what we call pretend Indians. You know, I was in film when I was, when I was a young girl, Um, I was in 17. I just got um, on uh, uh, the, the movie Geronimo. Um, And it was a great opportunity. I'm so grateful to this day, but I had a speaking role in that film and I had to go into makeup and uh, they had cans of black spray for my hair to color it. They had red um, paint or uh, blush or whatever to make my face more redder. And so I asked, and I got to know the crew, I got to know everyone because I was a stand-in as well, a lead stand-in in in that that film, uh, Geronimo. Um, I even got to know all the way up to the the director, Walter Hill. But the makeup crew, I asked, what is this for? Why are you, what, I don't, what is this? Can you explain to me? Oh, we need to make your hair black. You know, we need to make your face red. I go, why do you need to make my face red? And I remember the person put makeup on me. She's like, I don't know. We were just told to do this. I'm like, well, I'm going to tell you that's not going on my face and you're not coloring my hair because you're giving the false impression that this is what made it. So, and you are what native looks like. And she, she looked at me like, Oh my goodness. So I, and I went all the way to the director. I said, Walter, I'm not getting my face painted. I'm not getting my, my hair colored. So I didn't, but you know, they did had to, because I was, it was my first acting debut. I was sweating and everything. So they did put powder on, but I said, no red. I don't want red. Um, but that person, that person who, who was in that film is not, he's not native. Um, so that gave that false in terms of the, the, the theme of the story, it it is about protecting our mother earth. You know, she is hurting. Um, we talk about land trauma. Um, it was a a good friend of mine that I heard from, um, um, Canoe Emanuel, who is, um, who is an activist up in Canada. Um, she's standing in the front lines on one of the pipelines, but she talked about land trauma and that was our connection to mother earth, how she's hurting that how she's dealing with trauma is with, with mineral extraction. It's with, um, with the environment, with pollution, that trauma as native peoples, we can feel it. And I'm sure there's, they're not only native, but we can feel that trauma. We can feel the hurt that she's going through, which releases our form of what's depression, um, our form of um, just a lot of mental health, you know? And so I see that. And so that theme of that commercial was a, 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 an equivalent to what how we're hurting our mother earth. And that's when I think of um, most Uh, Native, well, I would say all Native people that truly have come from reservations are stewards of the land. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I mean, it's, it's through and through. It's in their thought process. It's in the way they speak of it. And if you learn that much, it's a good, yeah, it's a good feeling to connect on that level with Earth. Well, I think that brings us back to Bears Ears and what's happening there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It is. Um, Bears Ears National Monument. I mean, Bears Ears. So in my language, it's um, Shush Shop, and that's Bears Ears. That area is so important for us because it's a place of where we sought refuge when my people were being rounded up on the long walk. Um, it was a place where we, it's our medicine cabinet, according to my grandfather, Commissioner Willie Gray Eyes. Um, we, we gather our, our medicines. Well, aren't there. your grandfather? So Willie so, Gray Eyes is your grandfather? So we have clans, um, clan systems. And so um, that's how we identify ourselves within our, our Diné culture. So in my language, whenever I do an introduction, this is what I always say. Yat Eshe Divina Smith Yinashia. And when I say that, it gives the other person an, an opportunity like, oh, well, your clan is this, oh, you know what? You're my aunt, you're my sister, you're my grandfather, you're my grandmother. Um, you know, there's all the different forms and that's why it's so important we don't forget our clans. And what I said was, I'm um, my clans are, we, and we're a mat um, matrilineal society, so we always go with our mother's clan. So my mother's clan is red running into the water. And my father's clan is the Edgewater clan. And then further, I went down to my grandfather, which is the um, Bears Ears folded, or folded Arms clan. And then on my grandmother's side, on my mother's side, is the Mexican Navajo people clan. And so Willie is my clan, my grandfather. So to be respectful to him, I, tr I introduce him as my grandfather. So that's how I identify, that's how we are connected. I have read about the Gray Isles families in researching. So that was just exciting. And they're, they've, everyone needs to read about um, these names that you hear. Just go Google, look it up. It's, there's all these beautiful stories attached to each one and you'll get lost. Yeah. That's and amazing. They click. So just go your own way. Once you start clicking, because gray eyes was one that I happened to click on for a minute somewhere along the way in these stories. Right. I love that. Okay. So he was your grandfather. <laughs> so, so according to him, as long as, our, as well as our other elders talk about, you know, that area being in our medicine cabinet, my grandmother was an herbalist. And so we would go to Bears Ears and gather herbs and also other plants because she was a weaver as well. So the plants also um, supported the colors of the dyes that she needed when she made her rugs. Um, so there was a lot about Bears Ears. I mean, it's a sacred place for us. It's a place where we also go for healing. Um, during the pandemic, it's been very difficult for me because uh, I, I, you know, not not going home and also protecting my home because I want to protect our elders and making sure I didn't carry, you know, the, um, the, pet, the, the virus. And so, uh, it's been, it's been since October, since I've been home. Um, and the one place that I, when I'm able to, I will definitely go by Bears Ears because that's a place where I can also go for healing. And, um, it's not only for Diné people, um, it's in the proclamation, when it was written, it talked about co-management among tribes. So the tribes that are connected to that sacred place are, of course, Diné, Ute, uh, Hopi, the Puebloan. Um, there are a lot of um, ancestral Puebloan homes around there. So that's their ancestors. And then we have also um, the, um, the Paiute. And um, so those are the tribes that are connected to that area. Can you tell us a little bit about the run that you did in 2018 and like, and maybe also touch on like what actually is going on there um, for the listeners that aren't really familiar with the, with the issues. So, um, and when um, president Obama was in uh, was when he was a president, we, a group of tribes, um, tribal coalition, which was under Utah Genebikea and Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, came together and um, implemented a proclamation of a plan to designate Bears Ears um, with the co-management of tribes. And that's when uh, former um, Secretary of Department of Interior Sally Jewell came out to Southern Utah and met with tribal leaders, also with the governor of Utah at the time. 
and listened, sat in a teepee and listened um, in a respectful manner and heard from every tribe, every commissioner, council uh, member and house of rep and governor about the importance of why bears ears needed to be designated and protected mostly from um, companies that wanted that looked at it for uh, mineral extraction and so um, she did then took the reports back to um, the former president barack obama and it was then put in place it was implemented as bears ears national monument and uh, then the former the most recent administration came um, and basically reduced it significantly by, I believe, 80% as well. And since then, we've been, we've had every organization from Sierra Clubs, SUA, um, Grand Staircase, even tribal uh, leaders, uh, tribes have come in and um, implemented lawsuits. And now with the new appointment. Of so Secretary, then you did your run. And then I did my run. Yes. So yes. I did my, my prayer run, 330 mile prayer run. Um, it was when I was executive director for Salt Lake City Air Protectors. Here in Salt Lake, we're also trying to, to stand against air pollution as well. Um, but the first prayer run I did was a, it's a healing prayer run. And I felt this prayer run needed to happen because every organization was, I could just feel the energy of just exhaustion. I could feel like maybe there was not even no hope. So I, I uh, spent a day before my run with um, um, board member, Jonah Yellowman, who's also a medicine man. Uh, the, the day before we went up to Bears Ears and gathered uh, some of the um, sacred herbs or, um, that I would be using to, to carry on my prayer run. And, um, I share this with you, Stormy, but on that day, my, um, the medicine man, Jonah, he said, look at this. He's like, look at this today. Look at, there's something so different. And I was looking around, looking at all the, the plants, um, you know, herbs and I said, yeah, there's just so much more. Like I've just, I'm, there's like an abundance. He said, no, it's, they're excited. They're standing tall to wanting to be picked because they know what you're here for. And I immediately felt my grandmothers because I have one grandmother who I mentioned is an herbalist. And I have another grandmother who was about land protection advocacy work. So that was very emotional to feel that presence and to see the abundance of these, these plants just standing tall. So um, in a respectful manner, you, we did you know, our prayers and we selected the herbs and I had it in a medicine bundle um, and I carried it on a runner's backpack on my back on the whole journey. Um, and there were days when I ran, I was running in August um, and initially it was supposed to be, I had, it was a running group. There was a group of young runners that was going to run together. Um, but I got a call to admit two weeks prior and was told that they had to pull out because school, most of them were college students had begun. And so I completely understand. I'm always supportive of our youth furthering their, you know, their, their mind and education. But I was sitting in the parking lot and my hands was on the steering wheel, white knuckling it, like, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? And then it's like, I felt something slapping up the back of my head saying, you're going to do it. <laughs> so um, I've been a runner, a cross country runner. Yeah. I do. <laughs> but um, I said, okay, I'm going to run. I'll go ahead and run. Yeah, and those plants went with her well, the whole nice. way and blessed people sprinkled along the way to as gifts. That's so beautiful. And how long did it take you to do the full run? So the run was a 13-day journey. And out of the 13 days, I ran nine of those days on my own. So I, I pulled in about a little over 200 miles. But um, once the word was getting out, I, I it was a healing run. So I had invited 
I wanted to invite people to participate. And keep in mind, I didn't run like the, there were days when I ran 20 miles, I'll get to 30 miles, but I didn't run straight. So there were days when I'm like, okay, I'm going to run, I'm going to walk for a bit, I'm going to jog and I'm going to run. Um, the longer, the, the days that had longer miles, I would come in about maybe two or three in the morning. Um, but then when people started you know, wanting to participate in coming, becoming involved. I might have people from California coming to participate. I even had elders, you know, one man, he, he was, um, he had arthritis in his joints and his legs. And he said, I don't know, you know, my grandkids will run, but I'm here to support them. When he saw his grandkids, I think that inspired him so much that he actually got out of the car and he walked for a good three, four miles. And then I had a grandfather who said, we heard about you. We want to come, oh, you know, my oh, grandkids. Oh, give me come. chills. Yeah. The, 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 the kids, you know, they ran a mile, but they felt like they were running miles and they're like, okay, was that enough? I'm like, I was ready to cry. I said, that was more than enough. I said, you really, I said, thank you. And the one thing is I know mm. that they're thinking about to this day, um, which brings me up to our second annual we'll have a second annual prayer run this year oh my gosh same from bears ears to salt lake so it's going to be we're also including grand staircase escalante so this is a little Will it be bears ears to so bears ears to grand staircase uh and then up to salt lake city so that's around a little over about 400 miles around there so i'd love to know like what your thoughts are on the next administration so is there any idea or, or kind of insight on what he might do to maybe reverse what Trump took back, if that, that makes sense? And then I want you to go back and talk about the date of this run. Um, I am looking forward I'm to- I'm running this time. I remember last time. <laughs> well, good. Um, I'm looking forward to the new administration. Um, I think right now the most important was, of course, and 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 celebrating the announcement and confirmation of um, Secretary, Madam Secretary Deb Holland um, to be in this amazing position, historical, um, but uh, I, we're very, I know everyone through native country had been crying, had been uh, a, a deep sigh of relief because again, keep in mind Department of Interior, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs was actually put under the Department of War, that, and that's where we were placed under. That's where the reservation implementation was put under. Now we have a Native woman who will be in that position to, um, in my mind, when I talk about the work I do, I always have want to have a mindset of Hojon, and Hojon is balance and harmony. And so now we have a Native woman to, to come into that position to bring balance and harmony. Um, and so um, I, I really commend her for the work she does. And she is definitely a role model um, to everyone. Um, and so I'm very excited to see what happens. I'm definitely looking forward to her uh, coming to visit both these national monuments, um, whether, and, and it, I'm sure it will be soon. Uh, because there's some work that needs to be done. So I, I'm very excited to to meet with her um, and have these conversations um, and what, what needs to happen and how we can move forward in that sense. Um, and also with, with um, President uh, Biden and uh, Vice President um, Kamala Harris, um, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what, what they can do as well. Right now with COVID, they've done a tremendous job um, actually also who they brought on their task force for COVID, one of which is our very own Dr. Uh, Jill Jim. Um, she's been amazing as well as um, uh, protecting our native communities, um, keeping us updated, um, implementing action, um, having her task force and working with our Navajo Nation president and vice president. So um, these are, the, it's amazing. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And my prayer run, what will happen is that will begin in the month of September. We're tentatively looking at September 5th through the 19th. Awesome. So 
Where can people find you, follow you, or learn, learn more. more about what you're doing? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> where they can find me. Gosh, I, um, mm-hmm. I I need a secretary to help me run a website of my own. But um, I, I'm on Instagram, um, dhasea. <laughs> I'm going to um, help you do that. <laughs> yes. Um, and... Um, there's a lot more that I'm doing. Yes. Well, hemp, hemp, again, this came, I always wanted to do something as a youth. And I think when we had that phone conversation, I was the age of 10. That's when Peabody Coal Mine Company came in place. When I talk about mineral extraction, um, coal was, um, when coal mine companies came into our reservation, Yes, that was a big contributor to economic growth and development. My father was uh, did work um, with these coal mine companies, um, and that did support and it did support his family. Whereas it impacted my grandmother and a few of the resistors because who are who were on HPL lands, which is Hopi partition lands, um, and and I could tell you know it it really. I'm sure it hurt her because she sees her kids, her sons working in this company that's forcibly trying to relocate her. Um, And many times they've tried, they've given, they would entice the families there. We'll give you this amount of money to relocate so you can purchase your own home. Well, when some of the families have done that, they had no idea of like how to live in a city. They didn't know they have to pay utility bills. I mean, right now on a reservation, we're still struggling to get electricity and running water. Um, so our way of life had been, it been changed. So um, since then, I've always felt, okay, what can we do to help our communities? How can we help them grow? And now that the coal mine companies have, are no longer in existence, um, it's definitely impacted our communities. So you guys are still struggling with electricity and running water today. Today, Today. yes. Today, we still are. Um, But right now, I feel there are changes that are happening. Um, There are grants. I mean, we have within our own um, our agencies, our administration. I know that's we have council delegates, twenty four council delegates, and they are doing amazing in in terms of wanting to to. Um, grow their communities, which one of them I'm in those communities. But for me, I'm looking at other ways to to continuously grow. How can we grow with our our form of growth and development um, economically? And hemp has been a way. Um, and so I'm looking. What I'm looking at is I would love to bring hemp facilities to our our, our tribes, our communities. We could be those makers of textiles. We could be those hemp makers of building products, hempcrete. I mean, there's so many possibilities and you have companies that are now starting to look at hemp products. We have um, Levi's, we have Legos, we have um, Patagonia. Um, A a friend of mine in Denver, uh, outskirts of Denver, he has a hemp farm and he just connected with um, other countries that want, that have hemp farms, but are looking to the U.S. to um, create these products if they have the facilities. And I'm thinking, you know, if my community, we have these facilities, that could be, I could connect those two, you know? And so that is what I'm looking at because then it trickles down to a lot of our own, we're, we're, we're becoming more sustainable in our financial stability, our mental health, where there's programs that could be coming out of that. We could grow our own grassroots um young youths that can look into STEM, we could look into business, could look into, there's so many possibilities. And that is what I'm looking at. Um, I have amazing partners, First Nation Sourcing, my friend, Cindy Mon. Um, she's who I've connected with. So these are, these are ideas that we're still working on. And, and um, that's what I'm, my, another focus I've been looking at as well. I love that. I love that. Yep. So anyone listening happens to be in this field, um, Davina, we've had a website up, Davina Smith. She, what was your Instagram again? It's D Haseya, H-A-S-E-Y-A. Yeah. D Haseya, H-A-S-E-Y-A. 
that's my that's my handle on uh, Instagram. And we will find you there. There's also a documentary that you spoke of, um, one that was done, I think, for the nation, and then one that was done on Utah PBS um, that yes. people can watch learning about these particular lands. Yes. Um, what I, was that called? Um, I, I forgot to mention I, I do documentary film work as well. So the documentary films that I've um, gratefully been had the opportunity to be a part of is um, – producing uh, Unspoken, uh, Native America's Boarding School, um, or America's Native American Boarding School. And the other is uh, We Shall Remain. My focus was uh, on my tribe, the Navajo. And then there is Long Walk Tears of the Navajo. Um, those are the, the ones that I have been involved with. I'm currently working on some other projects um, one of which is definitely um, doing a story about my grandmother, the late Catherine Smith, uh, our woman warrior. So um, working with the script writer and we're, we're, you know, writing away and creating that film project. And then if there was what everyone Google Catherine Smith, this woman uh, passed away not long ago, but she lived to be 98 years old. And I would try to put words to her life, but I would not be respecting her enough to try to put words on her. You need to go read about her. And I wish I could have met this woman. She's, she's one of those people that literally paved a way and you just didn't know how hard she was working. Um, so Google her for sure or give her some love um what can anyone who's listening that piece you can do every day or just learn a little more um learn more about our country about this land about where we came from true history without being offensive <laughs> or a karen how how would you or appropriating or appropriating exactly how would you, you know, what are some words of advice of where people can go get involved or? or I, feel, I feel where people can get involved um, are in, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations. A lot of people put a lot of their sweat, tears in developing these organizations. Um, and I think that's where the, one of the areas to definitely look into that um, have a specific focus, whether it's in your community or on a national level, um, because they do have people, staff that are within those organizations that do the work. They go out and they gather um, the information needed. So then people such as you that, you know, are wanting to know more, they can go in these organizations and look at what has been done so far. Um, and then also locally, um, there are some uh, tr if there are tribes, tribal communities in your area, you know, um, possibly look into connecting with the tribe and seeing, um, and there are tribes that have also organizations as well. And so you can connect with, um, we do have a lot of uh, events that we do to, for the public. Uh, we do a lot of fundraising. Um, and that's one way to connect with, 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 um, tribes as well. I mean, there's almost like a calling to it. I told Davina, I was called to Sedona. I think feel like I was called to Peru. And I feel like that about this Four Corners trip. Like there's something I'm, there's something here. And we drove, we could only see Bears Ears yesterday. The locals advised us not to drive up closer because of snow. Yeah, in the RV. And, you know, I had never been that way. So I just believed them. But we did get out and just, made sure we sat quietly and parked and looked around. It was a beautiful desert forest on the way up there. And the mountain that's Bears Ears is just this beautiful little, you know, bump on the land from where we were. But you stand out there on this cute little two lane road and it's untouched and there's no telephone poles and you're breathing clean air. And we both felt it. Just stop it because I think you had told me about vortexes. We kind of talked about um, 
different feelings in the land. And I feel like we stopped somewhere and we just sat quietly for a little bit. We've been on our phones a lot and trying to involve people on this journey. And um, it was really powerful. So thank you, Davina. And we will be in touch during the... Um, during this journey, we've stopped almost everywhere, but we've passed on so many things because uh, we're in this big 32 foot. So by the time you're like, is that a national, you know, just a little clock on the road, we want to hit every one of them yeah. and we'll be going too fast and um, have to keep on heading out. But uh, we've stopped at so many places from cemeteries to rocks that were drawn to trading posts trading posts where i was able to buy this beautiful ring um from the zuni zuni nation or zuni tribe i think um and my goal is to get a piece of jewelry from each tribe here so i'm on the hunt that um, is and wonderful. then that's it yeah yeah these are going to be all of my mementos and I was so drawn to this ring, I slept in it. I haven't taken it off. Um, and I have a video about it because you can actually, we spent time talking to the woman at the trading post and she taught us about the different, how to identify the different, uh, who's making what jewelry. Yep. So I have to rewatch the video, but the- Like the inlay and the, things like the, that. The yeah. Zunis do this. And who did the overlay? The Hopis, the mm -hmm. Hopis did the overlay. And so those were those were what we learned and she walked us through how to identify which tribe we're buying from. Wow, Great. I, I love that. I love that, they're, that they are including the, the artist and um, the background from what, which is very important. Um, again, you know, um, today in other stores, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, high fashion stores where they would have something such as that and they sell them. It's, you know, no one's made them or manufactured, but the artists, there's always a story about every jewelry that's made um, and how much it went and their mindset. You know, we always, as a weaver, my grandmother would always tell me when she's ready to, to make a rug, she always wants to make sure it was made out of love, just like her cooking, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And it was so cool that each one of the pieces had a little cardboard and the person who, who had made it put their name on there. What? And so I bought a lot of earrings for gifts. I bought six pairs for gifts because I thought this is so special. Like it'll be so hard to find something like this. Yeah. The very, the, everything is unique. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I have so many, I'm spoiled. My parents spoil me with jewelry. So I, I, and every one of them is so important. Um, but the documentary film, um, We Shall Remain in the Navajo segment, I talk about um, silversmith making. So um, that's another thing. Also about all our, the other, other forms of artwork, you know, as you see back here is a basket that was passed down from generation to generation, it's over a hundred years old, you know, um, I'll pass that on to my daughter as well. Um, a rug, you know, so everything has a story about everything that we've, we've made. I love it so much. Well, we're going to be moving later. I think we're we back. Oh, oh, you are back. Okay. I was just going to say, I had told the Bina, and then we're going to end because we can record the ending later. But I had told you we were going to do all these things yesterday. We uh -huh. spent eight hours from um, Bluff what? to Cortez. Cortez. Eight hours. We didn't come to the motorhome park until 8 p.m. And we didn't do anything that you told us to do. <laughs> we just kept stopping and pulling over and pictures and have we it's too much beauty yeah. like people need to come here and don't come to like come to learn because people are here they're they're here to talk to you the woman at the store was so awesome Friendly. and open yeah. we spent 40 minutes at the store just learning about the different jewelry mm -hmm. um but yeah we're 
we're doing like 20 miles every three hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because every time you see something, you're like, we got to stop here. We got to stop there. I want a yeah. picture. And we're learning a ton, you know, so that's really the point of this. So every time we stop and then we start digging into. Well, when we have service. Yeah. Sometimes we don't have service. To sometimes we just make notes of things we have to remember. Google later. About. Yeah. <laughs> but it really has been the greatest. And I'm so glad you're in my life. Yes. Yeah. I am. I am so grateful that we've connected. Um, and I definitely in the future, I know we, um, the Navajo nation, um, is slowly lifting the, uh, curfew uh, because we're just so protective of our elders from the pandemic. But at some point where I grew up in Miami Valley, it's, it's, it's definitely a tourist area, but you know, one thing I appreciate you saying is, is understanding and learning these areas first, educating yourself. Um, and then when you go into these locations, um, having that deeper appreciation, not only for protecting the, the area, but also knowing that there is history in those these locations. There really is. Um, and yeah, um, and whoever, you know, if you want, someone wants to connect with me and say, hey, I heard you, you know, I would love to, 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 you know, just to have that conversation. And, um, and as I mentioned, I'm a board member for Grand Staircase National Monument. So that's another location to, that is connected to the, the Paiute Nation as well. So there's history in that area as well. But yeah, yeah, I'm so glad we connected. We're not passing that this time, right? Are we passing, are we passing the Grand no. Staircase right now? No, Grand Staircase is, is that, that's um that is on the south, more southwest, or yeah, south of the southwest of Utah. So that's so will I pass that? Is that by Zions? That is closer to um St. George, um, Cedar City area. Yeah. So I'm we're driving through those canyon lands on the way back. Uh, about March 25th. <clears throat> nice. But I find it interesting being from Utah, you go to all these canyons, but you get a little spoiled. Like I was <laughs> like, where's the Grand Escalante? I've been there 10 times, you know, but you get a little spoiled by having all this beauty around mm -hmm. us. Yeah. You that's do. A, you do. Well, it's been really fun for me because I'm a, a city boy from Baltimore <laughs> and I'm out here and it's all this nature and seeing all this beauty and I'm just taking it all in. And he's pretty bougie. <laughs> so, you know, he doesn't really do camping like this and stuff. And it, uh, you can see the change when he goes walking off by himself, you know, to go look at something in the desert in his Gucci shoes. You know, <laughs> you know like, and he just goes off. I'm so glad you brought that up from someone being in the city, Troy or Josh. Um, that is what, that is the one thing I talk about, especially on my prayer run. And the work that I do with BIPOC groups, a lot of the BIPOC groups, which are Black and um, Latina, you know, refugees or Asian, you know, they. This reminder of, you know, I did all kinds of coaching. I hope, in, you know, as we all went through COVID, if you had members and, you know, they kept reminding me um, that you are one. You are one with this earth. And once you really remember that, you will never be alone again. Mm -hmm. And that has been my, you know, one of my mantras through COVID is um, we have this beautiful, magical orb, like this sphere that we get to stand on, which is so crazy to even think about. And even if we're standing there by ourselves, it's because of the sphere that we're not alone. You could be solitaire alone, but you'd never be alone because you're standing on Mother Earth. Yeah. It's impossible to be alone. And that was one of the lessons they kept hitting. And um, it's a good lesson. Yeah, like even, definitely. you know, if you can just get yourself there and get a hug whenever you need it, it's been helpful, even though I forget that. Mother Earth gives hugs. <laughs> it's helpful. So beautiful thing. It really is. It really is. I am. Um, that's when I run. That's how I feel uh, on my prayer run. Like I mentioned, there were when I would run in two or three in the morning. I actually did like running at night 
because it was so quiet. Um, I saw a lot of night creatures, but I mm-hmm. felt at peace. Um, there are moments when I think about it now, like, wow, I can't believe I ran on days which were 20, anywhere from 20 to 30 miles. But I, I went into mm-hmm. this different form of mindset um, that didn't, where I didn't focus on running. I was, it was a meditative state. Um, and to this day, I will never take that for granted because there were moments that only I know what I went through is just amazing. Like I just, I don't even know how to explain it. I only invite people to be a part of this prayer run. So then they can go through their healing process and, and connect with mother earth. And so, um, that's why I felt on, on, um, doing our second annual prayer run, because we definitely went through a lot this past year. We definitely went through a lot with this, um, past administration. So now is the time to heal and let's move forward in that sense. So that's why I'm inviting everyone for the second annual prayer run. It is going to be around 400 miles, but, um, they're just to give an insight, you know, we've marked, uh, markers where we actually are going to be camping. I, I don't, I don't sleep in hotels or motels because it, it really defeats the purpose of staying connected with mother earth. Um, and the route that I've chosen mm-hmm. is the route that's less, that has less traffic. Um, uh, and of course I ran in August where it was like outrageously hot, three digit de- degree mm-hmm. weather, but you know, I Ooh. still did that. So I pushed it to September. Um, and you know, um, yeah. and so yeah, we're, we have six months to get that in works. So I'm training. I'm actually recovering from pneumonia. Thankfully I didn't have COVID. I'm, mm-hmm. I am vaccinated now. Um, but I'm recovering from my pneumonia. So it's just in that training process now to, to start running, um, strength training, um, how, what, watch what I eat. So then, uh, when it comes that time to run, you know, I'm ready to go. I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm, I was just going to commit to a certain number of miles and then I took it back because I'm a little older. I need to be sure that <laughs> I can really do those many miles, but maybe I just say that many miles in so many days. I don't have to do them all in one day. No, no. And, and, and I mean, like I said, during those days, I, I didn't run the whole, like I I would run maybe five miles and I'll walk another two or three miles, um, or I'll jog, you know, another additional miles. Um, it was, it just, it, it varied through the day, you know, maybe one morning I'm like, okay, I'm, it was actually towards the end of my nine days. Like I would end up running like a good 10 miles. I'm like, okay. You know, but the first part, you know, my first day I was like, I had to run 20, 25 miles. I'm like, what was I thinking while I was running? You know, Um, that's like a marathon. Yeah. It's a jet Boston marathon. (laughs) But, but, but I, I did it. So, I mean, and I never trained, I've never been an ultra marathon runner, never in my entire life. Maybe I did a couple five K's here and there, but I'm, and I'm, it's just, what your body is used to. And, and I always tell that to everyone, if you want to come out and run, or if you want to come out and walk, contribute those miles, so be it, you know, definitely come out. The most important thing is it's about healing. That's what I want to stress to everyone. Don't worry about how many miles that you have, that we did, we have to do that day. I'm not relying on everyone to complete that. All you're doing is contributing, you know, how many you want to put in, you know, and I'll do the rest. Um, because I'm inviting everyone to participate in this, this meditative, this healing, this prayer for yourself. This is for you. This is a time for you to heal. Oh, I can't wait for people to hear this. And it is an unbelievably beautiful time of year to be in Utah. Oh my gosh. That's September's a perfect. I'm excited. And that day when she was, when um, um, Madam Secretary Holland was appointed or confirmed, we were saying it's a good day to be indigenous. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I feel yeah, I bet the number of people that he's of color, he's put in a number of positions. It's, 
it's, it's, it's great. You know, for Utah though, there are moments where it, I'm like, really? <laughs> Utah needs to catch up. Utah definitely needs to catch up. <laughs> yeah. I think you can relate to that, right? Yeah. With the campaign. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, there is a bubble in Utah. And so before we close today, first of all, thanks for joining me. We're going to bring you some more episodes from the road. And, you know, these, ep these editions that I do, the Lunch Across America edition, the Liberty edition with all these focused people, you know, I find it inspiring. I find what Davina does, um, a needed effort in our universe and, as you listen to Lunch with Stormy, each guest, they're not there just because they can be. They're there because I want them to be because of their way that they move their wings and spread butterfly effects across the world. And that's what Davina does. And she left me with something that I can share with you um, that should leave butterfly effects across the world. And it's actually called How to Be an Ally to Indigenous Peoples. Care for the Earth give thanks frequently, learn about treaties. Remember that treaties are the supreme law of the United States. Let that sink in. Demand that our nation honor its treaty commitments. Consider future generations and all of your actions. Question and resist stereotypes, including team names and mascots. Learn about and reject the doctrine of discovery. Reach out to your indigenous neighbors. Slow down and listen more than you talk. Notice where you are, live with gratitude, live lightly on the earth, work to end global warming, support renewable energy, stop hydrofracking, dirty coal and uranium mining. Don't co-opt native cultures or ceremonies, return sacred objects, read and promote the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day every October 12th. Learn about people indigenous to wherever you are. Read native authors, support natives, crafts, peoples, businesses, and events. And remember that all beings, animals, and plants are your relatives and not just your resources. And finally, appreciate the diversity of nations, cultures, and people. That end. <laughs>